Life, nope, not yet. Life comes from death. At least that's the beginning of my story. Not long after seeing the EMTs try and fail to return breath to my dad's lungs after our van had rolled over on the highway a few times, I came to new life in Jesus. And it all happened here, in this city, so many years ago. When I said yes to Jesus for the first time, I had to surrender what I thought my life was going to be, a comfortable life as a chemical engineer who owned a home, hopefully with a white picket fence, a sports car, probably convertible, and so much more in terms of worldly gain. But who knew that that yes would start what is now a 30-year relationship with Jesus Christ? Now fast forward to 1996. I'm a sophomore in college, and I'm having just transferred from Rose Holman Institute of Technology and there I could only study engineering, math, physics, computer science, but then transferred to Indiana University where the options seemed limitless. I'm sitting in a seat just like yours in a plenary, in a plenary session just like this at Urbana 1996. I was pondering my life and my future. What do I wanna be? Who do I wanna become? What is God calling me to do? And how will I know for sure? In this kind of gathering with thousands of people worshiping God and being challenged to consider, to consider how to surrender and how to rise up, for me, I saw a vision. I saw a vision from God in sort of neon lights of a map, a map of Thailand, or Thailand was neon lighted where my parents were from, and Mexico, where I had done a number of short-term trips. But the meaning of that image, what I was supposed to do with it, was not immediately clear. Is that where I was gonna serve long term? But I hadn't been to Thailand for nearly 15 years, since I was nine years old. Was I going to graduate with a degree in Spanish and move to Mexico? But I held that vision of that map in my heart for 26 years. The Holy Spirit has been helping me to live into the fulfillment of that vision and of that moment. I did in fact graduate with a Spanish degree, but then I returned to Indiana University as an university staff. My mom was certainly dying to her own expectations for my life. Expectations of me becoming a chemical engineer with that wealth and that prestige. And at this point, not even just being a plain old local Spanish teacher at a high school. This vocation choice that I made of full-time ministry came with the weight of fundraising. And from the beginning of my life in missions, my mom had never allowed me to ask her friends or our family for financial support, as it came off as begging and was disgraceful to her. So even though being an Ivy staff was not in my plan or hers, God provided abundantly for my needs. As a campus minister, I had the privilege of leading groups of students to my ethnic homeland of Thailand, specifically to Bangkok, to live and to serve among the urban slum communities. And as good as this was, it was also super complicated. Thailand is 98% Buddhist, as was all my family, and not to mention that my mom's family is wealthy, and in Thailand, the milieu of the society has a lot of classism. So what did I know about leading Christian college students to live and serve among the urban poor? Hardly anything. More need to die to myself. Understanding my own credentials or abilities or skills was not gonna get the job done, but only by God's grace and the filling of the Holy Spirit in me. So in my 20s, I led these trips every summer to Bangkok, walking alongside students, helping them to learn to just be and not to do. The Global Urban Trek has never been about going to build something or to bring something or to do for other people, but the practice of being with, being among people and among the work of the kingdom that's already happening in the cities. We don't bring that work. It's happening, and how do we come in and walk alongside it? 
I got to practice my parents' native tongue, and I was even able to share my testimony in Thai among the people in those urban communities in Bangkok. And this was despite growing up among the cornfields and the suburbs of Indiana. Right around when I turned 30, there was another bend in my journey. After battling back pain for a few years, I woke up one morning paralyzed from the knees down. And did I mention this was about a month before my wedding? It was a shock to the system. I went into emergency surgery and came out with some, but very little function. I was in acute rehab in the hospital for the weeks leading up to my wedding. Now God is good, and I was able to walk down the aisle to my husband Andy with the help of my friends. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. And slowly, I relearned how to walk, going from a wheelchair to a walker to a cane to now just wearing braces most of the time. But these changes in my mobility really affected my being able to trek around the globe and take students to Bangkok. So while I was on disability officially and I had a lot of time to think, I was daily working through mourning the losses in my physical body. I considered where God was calling me. Where was he calling me next? Once again in my life, life only comes from death. I had worked for InterVarsity since graduating college. I planned to be a lifer. But this bend in the road, this setback, this death, was pushing me to be more rooted in my own neighborhood. My husband had just joined Servant Partners staff. Servant Partners is an organization that's committed to incarnational ministry among the urban poor in neighborhoods in the US and around the world. Joining him on Servant Partners would allow me to live out this calling to be flesh and blood to neighbors, among neighbors, not only for summers, but for a lifetime. So the last piece of that vision from Urbana 96 starts to come into focus. I didn't move to Mexico, but Mexico moved in with us in a way, in the person of Nayeli Barragan Sandoval. We just celebrated seven years since the day she moved into our house with me and Andy. She came in the door with a blue Rubbermaid bin of clothes, stored it in the coat closet, and slept on the futon in our living room. Now, 90% of the waking hours that she was with us, she spent most of that time, 90% of it, with headphones in her ears, walls around her heart, and a face that sort of said, F you, I don't need you. For her too, life is coming from death. Death to herself, death to traumas from the past that have hardened her. She's working through them to heal and to live life abundant. Receiving unconditional love from God the Father. Now when I look around our tiny neighborhood church plant in our neighborhood, we can see at least 12 members of our family and sort of growing every, every week. Those who are walking closer to Jesus. One of them has been in jail awaiting sentencing for five years. From the inside, he tells me how hard it is to keep his chin up. And though he calls me for encouragement, I hang up many times being invigorated in my own faith. His favorite verses are from 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'll read them for you now. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So for me, though, I saw this vivid vision in neon lights at Urbana 26 years ago. The fulfillment of that vision happened over many years. I learned to say yes and to move forward with Jesus, even when it wasn't clear where we were going or why. It meant 
dying to myself, to all that I had hoped for, and surrendering every small step that did bring joy, surrendering every small step along the way. My prayer for you, may you be blessed to do the same. Amen.